I live here. Eighth Man DVD Cartoon Classics. <laughs> the day before Christmas, and all through the hills the reindeer were playing, enjoying the spills of skating, and coasting, and climbing the willows, and hopscotch, and leapfrog, protected by pillows. Twice as big and twice as bright. Looky, looky, I'm Rudolph. Poor Rudolph. Where most reindeer's noses are brownish and tiny, Rudolph's was red, very large, and quite shiny. Rudolph! Go on home, red nose. Your mama's calling you. Come, come, Rudolph. Tonight you hang up your stocking. This dark, foggy night, awaiting the time for his Christmas Eve flight, good old Santa. Mmm, this fog will be hard to get through. Quick, quick, get hitched in a hurry. Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donna, Blitzer. To keep our direction, we'll have to fly low. Come down here, quick! Oh, pretty close. 
foggy, the night dark and drear, when Santa arrived at the home of the deer. But all this took time and filled Santa with gloom, while slowly he groped toward the next reindeer's room. The lamp wasn't burning. The glow came instead from Rudolph's red nose at the head of the bed. And then came the greatest idea in all history. So Rudolph is told of the dark and delay, the fog and the blackness, and losing the way. I need you tonight to lead all my deer on the rest of our flight. Dear Mommy and Daddy, I have gone to help Santa. Don't worry, Rudolph, that's me. Hurry, Rudolph, it's very dark here. Rudolph's red nose as a wonderful light, old Santa flew quickly the rest of the night. so fast that before it was day, the very last present was given away. Hear ye, hear ye, a message from Rudolph. Yes, they'd found Rudolph's message. It's all over town. Hear ye, hear ye, Rudolph at the stadium. Come on, come on. Bad deer who used to do nothing but tease him? Well, now they'd do anything only to please him. Rudolph, my boy, they'll envy you now far and near. For no greater honor can come to a deer than riding with Santa and guiding my sleigh. The number one job on the number one day. I hope you'll continue to keep us from grief. I hereby appoint you Commander-in-Chief. And Rudolph just blushed from his head to his toes until his whole fur was as red as his nose. Mary. Christmas to all, and to all a good night.
He will be here soon. Maggie, 
ho, bootle, 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 scootle, bootle, bay, scootle, babble, doodle, ho, bootle, bay, bootle, humpy, bootle, bay, bootle, doodle, day. Boom, 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 I don't have to worry, I don't have to care, my coat is very furry, I'm a grizzly grizzly bear. run away from home. <laughs>
creeping fast asleep. That's nice. That keeps you out of trouble, Prince. Christmas for the children. Everyone had to work all day and every day just to be able to keep themselves alive. There was no room anywhere for an animal who was too small or too scrawny to pull a plow or drive the water wheel. If he could not give wool, like the sheep, then he was of no use. Ah, stupid creature. Is there nothing you can do? I have no time for weaklings. Be off with you. 
poor little Burrow, no matter how willing he was or how hard he tried, if he couldn't do the work, he was just not wanted. Is it so strange to wonder why? Although I try and try and try, I cannot find a place to stay or even earn a sheaf of hay. Can it be because I'm so small that no one needs me, no one at all? If I were a stallion, a goat, or a camel, I'd be needed and fed every day. But because I'm a burrow, a little brown burrow, no one cares if I go or I stay. But when I'm bigger and stronger, I know there'll be plenty of places for me to go. There'll be work to do, a friend of my own, and I'll never again be Somewhere amongst that hustle and bustle would be water and food and, and who knows, maybe even a kind word. Miserable creature. You don't belong here. Shoo! Get out of here, you flea-ridden midget. This certainly didn't look like the friendly kind of place he'd been hoping for. Come on, little burrow. There's room here. <laughs> Greedy bunch. There's plenty there for this little burrow. <laughs> he will just have to wait until we're finished. <laughs> we come first. <laughs> it was all very well for them to take their time. They got water every day. But the little brown burrow hadn't had a drink for such a long time, and... Oh, he was so thirsty. Uh, oh. oh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Uh... Ahmed Akbar Ben Hashmid Omar Baba the Third. Uh, but you can call me Omar. Thanks, Omar. Uh, I say, do you mind... Oh. Oh. Uh, water and I are not the best of friends. Sorry, Omar. No matter. Gotta go now. Things to do, things to see. Uh... The day was finally drawing to a close, and the caravan began to settle down for the night. It had been a long, hard day for the little burrow. He was becoming very, very tired. May I stay here for the night? You? You are a donkey. We do not share our tent with donkeys. Be off with you. Please, may I stay here for the night? <laughs> stay with us? You are nothing but an underground donkey. An ass. <laughs> a jackass. Shoo! Be off with you. What's this? A mangy donkey? Go away. There's no room here for a mangy donkey. <laughs> mangy donkey, mangy donkey. Ah, be off, you flea-ridden midget, before I skin you alive. <laughs> oh, 
frightened, exhausted, and feeling very much alone. The little brown burrow wandered into the dark, forbidding hills. inconvenience you, but it's beginning to get rather wet here. As the storm raged on, the little burrow's heart swelled with happiness as he snuggled beside Omar. At last, he had found a friend. The next morning, as the sun broke brilliantly over the hills, the magic of the rain began its work on the dry desert. The rain has stopped, the storms pass by. A rainbow has joined the earth to the sky. The burrow is prancing, <laughs> enjoying with glee. Reflections the pools make, enchanting to see. The ants are teaching each other to swim. The beetles are marching. Ooh, what a din. The spider is busy. Shining her web, the lazy lizard has left his bed. Listen to how they chatter away as they run and they flap on this lovely day. The snake has slithered out of its lair. Blossoms blooming everywhere. All around us, the world's in a spin. With every creature joining in. Today's a day to be happy and gay. It's a day to remember. What a glorious day. Oh, it's a lovely day. Lovely, lovely day. Hey, hold on! Don't leave me behind! Omar and the little brown burrow trudged along behind the caravan, not knowing where they were going. At long last, the caravan halted. Come here, then, nice little donkey. I won't hurt you. <laughs> Tell me, what do you plan to do with that poor excuse of an animal? There's not much to recommend the scraggly little creature, but my beast has gone lame, and this one will have to take some of the load. Oh, at last. Someone realized how useful he could be. Who cared if he wasn't a stallion or a camel? I can work just as hard as the others. You wait and see. That's the spirit. It's all a matter of attitude. You show them. You great big lolloping water hoops. You'll be sorry picking on a little burrow like that. <laughs> Remember, he who laughs last, laughs longest. <laughs> <laughs> As the sun rose higher in the sky, the little burrow's hopes rose too. Maybe, he thought, maybe this is where I belong. 
And never again will people call me useless. Keep it up. Show them what you're made of. Only 100 more miles to go. Or, uh, I mean, uh, uh, 10. Or, or maybe it's uh, uh, two. Well, fame and fortune await us. Never say you can't, my friend. Never say you're through. You'll never reach your goals in life till you change your attitude. It's all a matter of attitude. It's how you think and plan. It's all a matter of attitude that makes you say, I can't. You've got to keep a stiff upper lip and hold your head up high. You've got to keep your eyes up front and never, never cry. It's all a matter of attitude. It's how you think and plan. It's all a matter of attitude that makes you say, I can. If you follow my advice, my friend, success will come, you'll see. You'll be rich and famous, wanted too, and happy as can be. It's all a matter of attitude. It's how you think and plan. It's all a matter of attitude. What makes you say, I can? When the sun was low on the horizon, the caravan stopped for the night. Oh, the burro was tired, but very happy and very proud to have done a useful day's work. They've tethered me, Omar. Do you know what that means? It means they want me to stay. They actually want me. And why shouldn't they? You did very well. I'm proud of you. Hmm. <laughs> Smells like supper's being served. Uh, is there anything you need before I go? I, um, I could do with a drink of water, uh, if it's not too much trouble. A friend in need is a friend indeed. No trouble at all. No trouble at... Water? Did you say water? If you don't mind. I hate water. Let me see. What should I put the water in? Aha! That'll do the trick. Oops! I knew I'd have trouble with the water. <laughs> water and I just don't agree. But where there's a will, there's a way. Phew, didn't spill a drop that time. Burrow, Burrow, where are you? Oh no, he's got to be here somewhere. Where is he? What's happened to my friend? Uh, gone to the bone heap uh, where he belongs, no doubt. Good riddance, sci <laughs> Did anyone see him leave? Did he run away? Was he stolen? Uh, should we tell him, do you think? Tell me what? Tell me what? Of uh, the wicked-looking man who dragged him off. Wicked man? What wicked man? I've got to find him. He's my friend. <laughs> The little brown burrow had not run away, neither had he been stolen, as Omar feared. He'd been traded for a sack of dates and couldn't believe his good fortune. During the next few days, people from all over saw the sign and came to inspect the little brown burrow. But no one was interested in such a small animal. Uh, you call that a donkey? You might as well try hitching up a flea. Your eyes must be getting weak, friend, if you think that thing will pass as a donkey. Why, I wouldn't give that stable room. <laughs> they told me you were strong, but you're just a heap of bones, you pitiful excuse for a donkey. I am not Tomorrow a... you go to the market, and if I can't get at least one piece of silver for you, then I'll feed you to the dogs. Poor little Burrow. The next morning was cold, and the Burrow sensed that winter wasn't far away. A chilly morning. Come.
Come on, you wretch. Come on. Let's hope I can find some fool at the market who's willing to buy you. Come on. Come on, you bag of bones. We've got to go to the market. And so the little burrow was led through the streets of a strange town. The sights and sounds made his head spin. For it was the time of the annual tax collection, and people had gathered from far and wide. There were magicians here and acrobats, peddlers and storytellers, merchants selling candied fruit and sweet wine, and everywhere goods were being bought and sold. I have just been sold for 100 pieces of silver. <laughs> I have been bought by a prince and will wear a saddle of gold and silver. Does anybody wish to buy this beautiful beast of burden? If ever a creature could do a good day's work, it is this powerful little animal. <laughs> Just look at this fine, sturdy donkey. Come, friends. Can you no buy for a bargain? I will buy the little brown burrow. For the last time, does anybody want this beautiful... Did you say you wanted him? Yes, I did. I will pay one piece of silver. What? You offer me only one piece of silver for this beautiful animal? See how sturdy he is. Did you ever see such strong legs or such a magnificent head? Why, I wouldn't dream of selling him for less than ten pieces of silver. One piece of silver is all I have. <laughs> Come now, you must have another piece tucked away somewhere. Under your belt, maybe, or inside your sandal. <sighs> all right, then. All right, I'll make a gift of him. Sold for one piece of silver. <laughs> the man's touch was gentle, and the little brown burrow felt strangely calm. The night was very cold, but the little brown burrow felt warm and secure inside. He had been through so much in the past few days that he'd almost given up hoping that he would ever be needed or wanted. How I wish Omar were here. Ah, at last I found you. You've no idea the worry and trouble I've been through. But, but tell me, are you all right? Have you been treated well? I've been bought for one piece of silver. A whole piece of silver? Well, didn't I tell you? All things come to those who wait. It's all a bad attitude. Uh, but listen, I found another caravan going south towards the coast. We can travel together and maybe reach the fabled land of Cathay. What do you say, little burrow? No, I... I don't think I should go, Omar. Think of the things we could do, the things we could see. Can you imagine the things we'd see if we should go to Cathay? Can you imagine the things we'd do and the fun we'd have each day? We'd see mountains and rivers, princes and kings, and maybe a palace or two. We travel in splendor, eat foods that delight, and dance till the whole day is through. Can you imagine the things we'd see if we should go to cafe? Can you imagine the things we'd do and the fun we have each day? Oh, Omar, you make it sound such fun. But I can't go. What? You don't want to go? I can't explain it, but I feel I ought to stay. That this is where I belong. You've been such a good friend to me. My only friend. Why don't you stay here with me? <laughs> Too cold. Too cold for me. Besides, travel's in my blood. I've itchy feet, you know. Itchy feet. 
I'm off to the warmth and sunshine of far-off lands. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Goodbye, Omar. I'll miss you. Poor Omar. He too was lonely. He'd never had a real friend before. But Omar felt that old itch urging him on. Oh. Hello, little friend. And how are you this morning? Here. This should keep you warm. We have a long journey ahead of us. So it was that one night long, long ago, in a lowly stable in Bethlehem, a little child was born. And there were abiding in the fields shepherds, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And three wise men came out of the east, and when they saw the child, they fell down and worshipped him, offering gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And had you been there on that night of nights, you'd have seen, standing proudly in a corner, a little brown burrow.
Isn't she pretty? I feel just like singing, Oh, you beautiful doll. Remember that song? Well, why not join me in singing it? Just follow the bouncing ball. Christmas comes, I pack my sled with dolls and drums, and I'm on my way with happiness for little girls and boys. Oh, there isn't any place to fall. I go wherever children are, always on my way with happiness, wrapped up in fancy toys. Christmas list, I've been names and places Though we've never seen their faces We know which one and the good they've done Oh, 
Over hill and dale again this year I brought glad tidings and a good cheer So until another Christmas day When I pay another call I'll say Merry Christmas
for Santa, huh? and in our little way, thank him for the happiness that came our way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Merry Christmas, Santa! A Christmas present for me? near Bethlehem sat a very young shepherd playing a gay happy tune on his little wooden pipe. In that year the Emperor of Rome had ordered all the people to be counted and taxed, each man in his own city. And so the highways were soon filled with travelers, returning to the towns where they had been born. On the road were a carpenter called Joseph and his wife, Mary. Their hometown, Bethlehem, was a city now filled with visitors, all looking for places to stay. And by twilight, Joseph and Mary were weary of searching. They had tried to find shelter for the night, and while people with plenty of money to offer were taken care of, Joseph and Mary were always turned away. Each place they stopped seemed to be full. Again and again they were disappointed and had to move on. When they came to the owner of one of the last inns, they were told that it too was full. But then the innkeeper remembered an old barn in back of his place of lodging. It was not much of a place, but Joseph and Mary were welcome to use it. This was where they would stay for the night. And in this old, dingy stable, the animals made room for the unexpected guests. As Joseph made Mary comfortable and the weary tourists took their rest, night settled over Bethlehem. And in the stillness of that holy night, the little town waited silently for the wondrous gift that was to be given. In the sky that night, in the sky above the sleeping city, a strange new star appeared, the star of Bethlehem, telling of the birth of a great new king to be cradled in a manger. And so it was that Christ the Savior was born in Bethlehem on that silent night so long ago. Nearby in the countryside, 
the shepherds were watching by their fires. Then with the star appeared a light, bright with the glory of angels, angels who sang to them of the birth of a king in a manger in Bethlehem. wonder and surprise, the shepherds hoped to see the child of whom the angels sang. They gathered their sheep together and started toward the town. From the hilltop they could see the star, and beneath it they knew they would find the stable whose manger held the heavenly king. On they came, and the first to arrive was the very young shepherd, playing his pipe. As he saw the baby with Mary and Joseph, he came close to the manger. Before the holy child, the shepherds all knelt and offered to him the beloved pipe, a sheepskin cap, and a little lamb. And when they had worshipped him, they would go to tell others of this wonderful thing that had happened. Far to the east, there were others who saw the star. In Turkestan, a princely astronomer sat studying his instruments. And suddenly in the sky above, the new star shone. In India, a king watched from the balcony of his marble-columned palace as the star grew larger and larger. And on the desert sands of Arabia, a ruler was gazing toward the heavens, seeing that same star as it told of the new king's birth. To them all, it meant that a king had been sent from God a king they would worship. Each one set out to follow the star and to bring to the child a gift of love. The astronomer boarded his ship. And sailed over the waves toward the guiding star. The Indian ruler, on an elephant, moved toward the mountains as the star went before him. And from Arabia, across the desert, came the third king on a camel. It was a long journey and a hard one for all of them. But as they followed the star, each came nearer to the land of Israel, where Herod ruled. King Herod also saw the star and sent for his counselors. To Herod's advisors, the star fulfilled a prophecy that a king should be born in Bethlehem, in the land of Judah. And while the eastern kings continued their journey toward Jerusalem, Herod was disturbed by this unwelcome news.
thinking surely that King Herod could direct them to the newborn child, the wise men came to his palace to seek his advice. Perhaps they would find the babe there, in the palace. Herod sent them to Bethlehem, saying, When you have found the child, tell me that I may worship him also. Of course, the wicked Herod had other plans, for he was jealous of the child king. But the wise men, who would be warned by God, were to return home another way. And so once more the kings from the east took their gifts and followed the guiding star. It led them out the north gates of the city, on toward the Bethlehem hills. Then, above the little town, it seemed to stop. At last they knew that here, in Bethlehem, they should find the newborn king. They did find him, and with him the young shepherd who had brought the first gift to the manger. They knew that the star had led them to this child who was the king they were seeking. The wise men went into the holy family and offered their gifts to the infant Jesus. Filled with awe and wonder, they knelt before him and put at his feet a crown of gold. A chest of frankincense. A jar of myrrh. And they worshipped him, the child of the line of David, the son of God, the king to be called Emmanuel. after you're in bed and sound asleep, kids. And it's just about time you kids were in bed anyhow. Will you tell us the story first? Yeah, proof the story. I want to hear about me and Mr. Scrooge. I want to hear about the little old angel. <laughs> well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I'll tell you what. How would you like to hear a brand new, never-before-told story of Christmas? A story that no one ever heard? That's right. Now, that actually happened to me when I was a forest ranger in Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> that was many years back. Say, you climb up here in my lap, and I'll tell you all about it. Now, here we go. <laughs> oh, boy, a new Christmas story. That's right, a brand new Christmas story. Thank you. 
was gone, but what a year! Now it's here, now it's here, bringing lots of joy and cheer. Tra -la 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 -la. There is a Santa Claus. Christmas comes, but once a year. Now it's here, now it's here, bringing lots of joy and cheer. Tra -la 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 -la. Oh! <laughs> Looks like a pretty gloomy Christmas for those poor kids. What can I do? Let me think. Huh? 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 Ah! Oh, no, 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 no.
just like the planes do. Though the day may be long, you never will go wrong. Off key, on key, any old key, just start the day with a song. First, first day of winter. Sing the same song 
Sugar plums danced through their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out in the woods there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. And what to my wondering eyes did appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old quick, I knew in a moment he must be Saint Nick. More rapid than eagles, his courses they came, and he whistled and then called them by name. No dasher, no dancer, no prancer and vixen. On, comets, on, Cupid, on, Dom and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now, dash away, dash away, whoa, they're all. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. A bundle of toys he'd flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack.
Having finished his task, he spoke not a word, but shouldered his sack and rose like a bird to the top of the chimney and across to his sleigh. Then he stopped and he listened. It was now Christmas Day. He grasped both the reins to his team, gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night! And when people used horses if they wanted to go out for a ride, and oil lamps and candles if needed a light, there lived in a small country town, yes, a butcher, a baker, and a candlestick maker. With just over a week to go before Christmas, the townspeople were busy indeed and none more so than the candle maker and his young son, Tom. For in those days, quite small boys were expected to behave like grown men. Thank you. 
For years now, every Saturday at four o'clock, the candle maker had been making the journey from his shop to the church across the square. Because God had been so good to him and blessed his home and his work, he showed his gratitude by giving his finest candles to shine upon the altar as an offering to God. so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Whenever I read these words of Jesus, I think of one of our own people, our friend the candle maker, like a good steward, chose his love for God by giving his most beautiful candles to light the cross upon our altar. I pray that all of us will always give in this same spirit to show our love for the Father, who blessed us with a Christ child. The family was up early next morning, for a busy week lay ahead. The candle maker had to deliver quantities of Christmas candles, of all shapes and sizes, to the outlying farms and villages. Hurry up, son. Coming, Father. Now, now. I'm not going away forever. I'll be back on Christmas Eve, in time for service. Look after your mother, son. And there are plenty of candles to be made. Don't worry, Father. Don't forget this week, I'm leaving you to make the second altar candle. I have made only one. And remember, both must be taken over to church by 4 o'clock Saturday. Yes, Father. Goodbye now. Goodbye. Bye, Father. With his father away and his mother extra busy getting ready for Christmas, young Tom was in charge of the workshop. With the task of turning out many candles a day. And then there was the altar candle for the Christmas Eve service on Saturday. On that Christmas Eve long ago, the church was made beautiful by the loving work of loving hands, just as churches are today. Then, as now, there was a manger where boys and girls would bring the white Christmas offering for the children's home.
get washed up for supper. Your father will be home soon. Tommy, you forgot. Run over quickly now. And be careful you don't drop them. I'm sorry I was late for the candles, Pastor. Never mind. You did do it. And just in time, too. Look who's coming. Well, son, did you make the church candle? Yes, Father. had his own sad thoughts that night. To think that a son of mine should make such a candle, a worthless candle that won't shine, and after all these years. Young Tom knew what his parents were thinking, that he had failed them, and that he had failed God. years ago, but the candlemaker's son learned the meaning of Christian stewardship, just as we must learn it today.
knelt. Once upon a long, long time ago, in a far-off country, there lived a very little camel who was woolly in spots and curious all over. And the littlest camel's curiosity concerned kings. This small one, above all else, wanted to see a king. Cappy and Mogo, the bigger and the biggest camel, boasted often and loudly of carrying gold and precious jewels to king's palaces. But the littlest camel carried only everyday things to everyday people, and he longed, oh so very much, to carry wondrous gifts to a king. Cappy and Mogo had that very night returned from seeing a king, none other than King Herod. But Mogo was very tired and also very cross. So the littlest camel just munched and listened while Mogo complained that the hay was tasteless and the stable was very uncomfortable after the delicious food they had been given in the grand palace stables they had visited. Mogo almost bit the littlest camel's head off when he questioned him. But the littlest camel understood and was very sorry that Cappy and Mogo were so tired. But he also thought it rather silly for a great big camel to be so grouchy. Just then, Baldazar, their master, came into the stable with two other wise men, Melchior and Gaspar. Their servants began loading great treasures on the bigger and biggest camels. They were to start at once on a long journey to Bethlehem with gifts for a very great king. And then, mind you, when the three wise men were ready to leave, Cappy and Mogo were too tired. Too tired even to go see another king. But the littlest camel, he was not tired. If they would ask him, he would go. And would you believe it? They did ask him to go. Master Baldazar said that because the big camels were so tired, he would have to take the littlest camel too, and that they would have to leave immediately while they could still see the star that would guide them. My gracious goodness, just think how wonderful it would be. Soon he would be treated as royalty, and he could eat sweet, sweet hay and sleep on the soft, soft straw in the palace stables. And he could not help thinking that maybe a great king, robed in silks and satins, with a golden crown upon his head, might pass real close to him. There would be lovely soft music everywhere. He knew, for he had heard Cappy and Mogo talking about the kings and their palaces. At long last, everything was ready. The gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh and precious jewels were loaded on his willing little woolly back and they started out through the gate of the city on their journey to far off Bethlehem. He heard them say again as they started forth that a star of all things would guide them. He liked stars, but he thought it very foolish that a star could guide anyone anywhere, much less to a king. Just then he saw the star a brighter and lovelier star than the littlest camel had ever beheld, and it shone ahead, leading the way. Around them, the air was so soft and warm, and the littlest camel heard a light rustling of wings, as if many, many birds were close above them, or perhaps wings of angels. But as they journeyed on, the littlest camel learned that even precious burdens can become awfully heavy, though he didn't complain. He just followed the shining silvery star bearing his load, importantly. After many, many miles, it seemed that they were not getting any closer at all, and the littlest camel was oh so very tired. As they plodded along, he remembered the palace the big camels had told him about, the great marble palace with a shining golden door.
and there, sweet music would be everywhere, and great sparkling jewels, and he would see a king. Finally, they came to Bethlehem. But now the star was shining down upon a stable, a plain, everyday stable, such as the littlest camel had seen many, many times at home. Camel supposed the star knew how very tired he was, and it paused to allow him to rest, for certainly this stable could never belong to a king. The littlest camel was so confused, this was nothing like what Cappy and Mogo had said it would be. He just rested on the soft sand and wearily looked at the beautiful star, and it seemed to comfort him. In the meantime, the wise men unloaded their gifts and carried them through a lowly door. But where was the palace? Where was the king? This was only a very poor stable. But the large, large camel stood very still, and the littlest camel decided he wouldn't ask them. He tasted the hay. It was not very good, and the straw was all scratchy beneath his feet. Maybe Cappy and Mogo had been fooling him about all these things. What were the wise men doing? He had just peeked to see. So quietly, carefully, he went forward and looked in the door. There was no king, only a baby, a tiny little baby in a beautiful woman's arms, and shepherds everyday shepherds as he had seen many times before. a wee lamb, and a kindly-looking old cow standing near, all quietly, reverently watching. And the littlest camel looked too. And all at once, there was something different about this baby. There appeared a wreath of tiny silver stars that shone softly about the baby's head. The littlest camel felt all glad and tingly inside, and his tiredness was all gone, swept away by the presence of this adorable baby. Then the wise men, kneeling, bent forward to place their gifts at the feet of the mother and child. And one by one, the animals bent their knees in reverence too. The littlest camel was very happy, and as he looked at Cappy and Mogo, they too seemed happier and more friendly. Suddenly the hay seemed to become very sweet, and the straw as soft as thistledown. He heard the soft rustling of angels' wings, and there was music everywhere. Somehow the littlest camel knew that this wee baby held for all the world joy, peace, and happiness. 
And when he saw all the others silently and reverently kneeling, the littlest camel wanted to show his feelings too. He wanted to kneel because he felt all worshipful. Very carefully, he bent his short little legs until he too was kneeling. And Cappy and Mogo, the bigger and biggest camels, were amazed when they saw that the littlest camel was actually kneeling. Ever since that long, long time ago, in that far, far off land, big and little camels have remembered. And to this day, kneel in adoration, just as the littlest camel first knelt when he went to see a king. Bye. 
Come with me, come and see all the wonders there will be in my stories, in my songs, in everything where fun belongs. We'll meet heroes, giants bold, is it lands both hot and cold, have magic tricks to shiver your skin, laughs galore with animals in our world of fun. Hi, Piper, hi. Have you ever stopped to think that toys may have a life of their own? You don't think they do, eh? Well, they have in Storyland. Our tale today is about a little tin soldier who had more adventures in one day than most people have in their whole lives. He was a small plane soldier and had been given as a Christmas present to a little boy who wasn't too pleased. Why, it doesn't move. There isn't even a place to wind it up. Give it to me, then. I've got a ballerina doll that can't do anything either. She just stands there. This silly soldier can guard my doll. All right. I'm going to play with my wind-up soldiers. So the little tin soldier joined the other toys on the playroom table. And even though he couldn't talk, he did a great deal of thinking. How pretty she is. Even though I'm only a common tin soldier, I'll guard her with my life. He has such a kind face. I wish I could reach him. And that night, when all the household was asleep, it was the toys' turn to play. The dolls had a tea party. The mechanical soldiers marched up and down. The music box played and the top spun all by themselves. Only the little tin soldier remained steadfastly at attention. And the little doll went on holding out her arms and neither of them moved a muscle. I will love her as long as I live. How I wish he would stand a little closer. But unknown to them, they had an enemy. I don't like the way they look at each other. The doll is mine. I must get rid of this intruder. The next morning, the boy moved the tin soldier onto the windowsill, and the wicked jack-in-the-box saw his chance. I know how to work my own spring. I'll give him a surprise. <laughs> The little soldier has fallen out. What do I care? He can't move, so he's no good to me anyway. I suppose I should try to call out, but one shouldn't shout when one is in uniform. I wonder if anyone will ever find me. And before long, someone did find him. Hey, look what I've got. He's pretty funny looking. Let's make a boat and put him in it. Here, this old paper will do. Swiftly, the two boys fashioned a crude sailing boat. And with the little soldier standing beside the mast, they set it down in the gutter. On your way, little man. Look at him go. Look at him go. My word, I've always wanted to go on a voyage, but I didn't think it would be like this. If only she were here with me, I wouldn't care how rough it was. Suddenly, the boat was swept into a covered drain. Dear me, how dark it is. And the water is getting faster and faster. I must remain at attention whatever happens. Then the boat shot out of the drain and into a great canal. And it's starting to rain. This is too much. My boat's beginning to break up. My poor ballerina. Shall I ever see you again? Goodbye, world. Goodbye. But there were more surprises in store for the little soldier. As he began to sink, a most amazing thing happened. My goodness, it's dark in here. And how this fish does twist and turn. Someone must have him on the line. How right he was. And now the most astonishing events began. It's awfully quiet all of a sudden. Now what's going on, I wonder? My word, that was close. Why, look at this. Did you ever see such a thing? It looks like my soldier, all right. He's no good without his paint, though. He was no use anyway. What good is a soldier that can't even march? I'll stick him up here beside that silly dog. Now at last, the little tin soldier was standing close enough to his lady love to touch her, if he could move his arms. So there they stood. He at attention, and she with her arms held out to him. So near and yet so far. How gallant and brave he looks. If only I could tell him how much I care for him. How sweet she is. And I thought I'd never see her again. But I dare not reach out to her. I'm still on duty even if my colors have run. 
But the wicked Jack in the Box was not through with them yet. Sensing their loving thoughts, he became enraged. Gah! Look at them. It's more than I can stand. This time, I'll finish both of them. With a terrific spring, he swept them both off the table. What did you do that for? I didn't touch it. You did. Didn't, did. Didn't, did. Didn't. Together, the sweethearts lay motionless on the floor. <laughs> now look what you've done. I didn't touch it. Well, it's no use now. And she's no use either. Look at the mess she's in. I'll throw them in the toy chest. At least they'll be out of the way. And they were indeed out of the way. And together at last. So you see, you shouldn't ignore toys because they are plain or broken, for they may have a life of their own. And our little doll and her steadfast tin soldier, why, they lived happily ever after.
we are the toys for little girls and boys in the shanty for Santa Claus lives. We're playing here and bringing them to joys in the shanty for Santa Claus lives. We give the world just like we used to do. To make a wish and have that wish come true.
were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds 
while visions of sugar plums danced in their head. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be Saint Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now, Dasher! Now, Dancer! Now, Prancer and Fixer! On Comet! On Cupid! On Dunder and Blitzer! To the top of the porch! To the top of the wall! Now, dash away! Dash away! Dash away all! <laughs> As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet an obstacle, mount to the sky, so up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas too. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. <laughs> a bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled. His dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses. His nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow. And the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. <laughs> he had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him, in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, 
and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. and laying his finger aside of his nose. And giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, yeah. and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight. Happy Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. <laughs>
Boy, did we have a lot of excitement at our house last Christmas Eve. Boy, everybody was getting ready for the visit of Santa Claus. And Buffalo Bob was trimming the Christmas tree. And he was just hanging on the last decoration. Strings of fresh buttered popcorn. And Clarabelle the Clown, he was helping trim the tree, too. my stocking. Well, how you doing there, Howdy? Oh, finished, Buffalo Bob. Boy, I sure hope Santa Claus fills my stocking with presents. Uh, Clarabelle, uh, do you want to hang up your stocking now? bicycle pretty soon now, because it's almost midnight and Santa will be here any minute now. to be coming down a chimney at midnight. Hey, that's a pretty neat trick, Clarabelle. Gee, Buffalo Bob, what do you think happened to Santa Claus? Well, Harvey, there's only one way to find out. Well, what's that, Buffalo Bob? Let's go to the North Pole and see what happened to Santa Claus. You mean right up to Santa's workshop? That's just what I mean. We'll take the rocket doodle and, and we'll be up there in a jiffy. Come on, Claire, but you come too. Stop snowing, we'll have a great flight. North Pole, here we come. Santa Claus, you're a bandit. Here, you see? Let me show you. There, see? But I tell you, I'm not the bandit. I'm Santa Claus. Yeah, go on. The newspaper says that the bandit has a beard. Well, you got a beard. And I happen to be a big fan, see? And I happen to be smart. And I know, therefore, that you are the bandit. What's that? See, I'll bet that's your whole gang. Well, Ugly Sam is gonna hide, see? And I'm gonna capture the entire gang, single-handed. Hey, look, there's Santa's workshop right at the North Pole. Come on, fasten your seatbelts, everybody. We're coming in for a landing.
things going on around here. The bandit, I'm Santa Claus. Santa Claus! Yes, Sam, he's Santa Claus. I captured the bandit! And away I go to get him! Oh, no, no, I'll get him, Sam! Oh, no! Uh, wait, I, I know what, Ugly Sam. What do you want for Christmas? I want a mirror, so I can look at my beautiful, ugly face. Here you are, Ugly Sam, and a Merry Christmas. What? Oh, how beautiful! Bubba Bob, this ain't the bandit. This is Santa Claus. Oh, 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 oh. Well, it was nip and tuck, but everything worked out fine. Santa Claus got there in time to bring toys to all the boys and girls. Yes, everything turned out happy and bright. So, Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a good night. Oh, the old lady, old lady, I owe. That's hard rock and cocoa and joe. Now listen, my children, and you shall hear a story fantastic, a story so queer. It's all about Santa and his helpers three. There's Hard Rock and Coco and Joe. Now Hard's the driver up there by his sleigh. Coco reads maps and he shows him the way. Though old Santa really has no need for Joe, but takes him cause he loves him so. Oh, you lady, you lady, I hate. Donner and Blitzen away, away. Oh, you lady, you lady. I'm Hard Rock. I'm Coco. I'm Joe. And Santa is busy with his heavy pack. He trusts his drivers and never looks back. Oh, you lady, you lady, I'm home. I'm Hard Rock. I'm Coco. I'm Joe. Now go to bed early on this Christmas Eve. I've no way of knowing just what you'll receive. But you'll hear their laughter, that much I do know. Twill be Hard Rock and Coco and Joe. The three little men, only two feet high, singing to Santa way up in the sky, laughing and shouting as the sleigh bells ring. It's Hard Rock and Coco and Joe. Oh, the old lady, old lady, I hate. Donner and Blitzen, away, away. Oh, the old lady, old lady, I hope. He's Hard Rock. He's Coco. He's Joe. And Santa is busy with his heavy pack. He trusts his drivers and never looks back. Oh, the old lady, old lady, I hope. He's Hard Rock. He's Coco. He's Joe. Old Santa will come in and set down his pack. And Hard Rock will hold the reindeer till Santa comes back. If you hear a giggle as he turns to go, it's Coco a Snowball and Joe. Oh, little lady, oh, lady, I hate. Donner and Blitzen away, away. Oh, little lady, oh, lady, I hope. I'm Hard Rock. I'm Coco. I'm Joe. And Santa's busy with his heavy pack. He trusts his drivers and never looks back. Oh, little lady, oh, lady, I 
Ho, I'm Hard Rock, I'm Coco, I'm Joe. Oh, real lady, I